You sir? Cheers. Cheers. I'm Wilder Jones. I'm 29 years old and welcome to Wild Spaces Farm. We're located in Glens Ferry, Idaho on the Snake River. This is a 160 acre parcel dissected by Little Canyon Creek. It's the original homestead site of Gustavo Glen. Uh, Mr. Glen stopped to live here in, at this particular place and built a ferry for the pioneers on the old Oregon Trail to cross the Snake River. And this was the spot that he picked. So today we run a grass-fed raw milk micro dairy on this 160 acre parcel. Also helps my father's farm, King's Crown Organic Farm. Uh, we produce here on this farm, raw milk, yogurt, cheese, butter. We also have pastured chickens and grass-fed beef. So welcome to my farm. Oh yeah. Cream on top, we don't separate from grass to glass. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, sir. Cheers. Cheers. That's good stuff right there. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> it's getting better. Okay, Wilder, what are we looking at here? So this is the milk parlor. We do a single cow, one cow at a time milking in this stanchion. This is refurbished, repurposed. And yeah, this is where all the magic happens. How many cows do you milk a day in there? Right now we're milking five cows a day. And when the cows are milking, you milk them once a day? Yeah, we milk them once a day. Not and feeding any grain or uh, silage, no, no like high energy feed. So we're not creating any uh, mastitis issues or needing to milk twice a day. The, the way we milk twice a day is that we have the calves milk in the afternoon. So the cows get to raise their calves and that's an important part of what's valuable to us and valuable to our customers is knowing that these calves weren't taken away at birth, that these cows get to be moms. And uh, as part of the revenue of the farm is to also sell, sell live animals and to sell beef in the future as those calves get older. And what's this cow's name? This is uh, Trilly. Trilly? Short, Trilly, short for Trillium. <laughs> and uh, she's an American milking shorthorn. And that's the uh, only dairy breed, only dairy specific breed that uh, was ever developed in the United States. Wow. I got her from a gal that runs exclusively American milking shorthorns. Um, yeah, she's a, she's a great cow. She's really, really patient. Very cool. And, and what's Trilly eating right now? Trilly's eating some organic alfalfa pellets from a pellet mill in the town over. Okay. And, and, and your cows are 100% grass fed, right? Grass fed other than that little supplement right there, which is mostly just protein. And, and they get alfalfa and hay in the winter when the grass isn't growing, but no grain, no silage. No antibiotics, no hormones. And is this you just making sure everything looks good before you get started? Yeah, this is my utter prep. Um, so we do a cloth, a, a wet cloth, and you don't want to use too much water because water just moves bacteria around. Uh, but it is a really, I mean, you know, it's the universal solvent. So it does good on dirt and, and debris. And then I strip her dip them with iodine, and then I have this uh, teat wipe, uh, single-use teat wipe, and I'm actually going to use two, because Trilly had a calf a week ago today, and so I'm going to do the old taste test to see if um, there's any like lingering hints of, um, I guess you could say of infection. But just weirdness is what I'm looking for in the flavor and in the and in the appearance. So Trilly is the cow you were talking about yesterday that had the calf and and you weren't milking her. Yeah, I milk her, but I don't keep the milk. So okay. today might be the first day I keep the milk. Okay, so you have been milking her every day. Yeah, milked her for a week. 
and you just test each quarter at a time. The quarters are not, um, they're exclusive to each other. They're not, uh, oh, wow. they're not connected in any way. Interesting. So if there's an infection in one area, it's not necessarily in the other ones. I certainly, if I have a cow that's infected, I don't mess around and, like building a three quarter and then yeah. like, the fourth one out separate. Like, yep. uh, Can I give it a try? Certainly. Tastes good. There it is. <laughs> Warm. What did you think? Yeah, I like it. No, there's nothing alarming. And sometimes, uh, when they're really early into lactation, they'll, uh, there'll be a lot of cream. And sometimes that can taste a little different, but you recognize that it's not a bad flavor. It's great. But I've had my hand all over it, so I'll do one more heat wipe. Yeah. That switch is connected to my vacuum pump. That the so the red liquid was uh, iodine, mm -hmm. and that's just a, a cleaner of sorts. Yeah, yeah, just a disinfectant, really. Um, some people use some people use hydrogen peroxide, and. In the world of in the world of natural cheese making, um, often there's no solution because you want that bacterial community that is present on the tea and in the mm. tea canal to be present in the milk to create the flavor profile of the cheese that you're consuming. And what is the cow going through right now as you do this? Um, is, is she um, getting relief of sorts? Yeah, there's probably a little relief because she has that extra production from being so early in lactation. Mm -hmm. Probably a little oxytocin, probably a little dopamine from the extra food. And uh, I can't imagine that there's not probably a little lingering anxiety of like wondering where her calf is every mm -hmm. 20 seconds, you know. But, yeah. Uh, and I was curious because she kind of just walked right in here. Yeah. Like it was a, a process she was almost looking forward to. Yeah, yeah, they know the treats in here and there's a little relief from this process. Uh, she'll, she can get weary uh, or weary right at the end and like, kind of wonder where her calf might be. And once, then how long will they lactate after they yeah, get birth? Once they're lactating, they, they can lactate. You know, the internet is going to tell you 42 weeks. Mm -hmm. um, there's probably a lot to be said about it regarding your operations process. Mm -hmm. So like me being all on grass and sharing with the calves and not taking the calves away, like I probably am always going to run up against like 35 weeks. And Curly's telling us he's done. Done Curly. So how many gallons would you estimate that you just got out of Truly? Out of Truly? Mm -hmm. That might have been two. That might have been two gallons. Okay. That one might be a little more. Is that pretty typical, you think? Yeah. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> Alright, How long will all these cows stay in, in this area? Yeah, they'll probably stay here. Let's see, it's 10.30. They'll probably be here another hour. Okay, then um, you'll move them out to the pasture? No, they can leave anytime they want. Oh, okay. Yeah, they, and they, they don't even... I don't oh, know. Through, you leave that open over there? Yeah, I don't even have to close it. And you let me name one yesterday. Yeah, that's that one taking a stretch over there. That's over on the left side? Yeah. I named, I named her ears because I thought her ears looked funny. Are you okay with that name? Oh, I love it. We need names around here. We're gonna name stuff. We're gonna have names. 
All right, Wilder, you want to speak to some of your sanitation practices for a minute? Yeah, so I guess I want to start by saying that I don't encourage anyone to drink raw milk. Raw milk has inherent risks. Um, however, it can be produced in a clean uh, and relatively risk-free manner. And that's part of uh, following some pretty stringent standards and guide guidelines. Um, and so I like to say that we reduce risk in, in three areas. One, the first would be the animal's uh, health and lifestyle. The other area is the milk handler and milk handling equipment. And the third area is the, the consumer themselves reducing risk. So the cows, we like to offer them 24 hour access to pasture so that they can live a natural, instinctive life, um, not crowded and not in confinement and not standing in their own refuse. And we don't offer them any grain or silage, which is not part of their natural diet. And that can lead to uh, complications with inflammation and infection and so we're reducing our risk, uh, the risk of our animals producing unsafe milk because the animal is living a lifestyle congruent with its ancestral behavior and the second area is myself and my friend that helps me milk and all of our equipment and we do things like cooling the milk below 40 degrees within 45 minutes uh, using a parasitic acid as a sanitizer to clean our milking equipment, which is like a really potent uh, hydrogen peroxide that breaks down any biological membranes. And we also use this commercial dishwasher, which runs at 190 degrees Fahrenheit, and we use that to that heat to sanitize all of our uh, packaging equipment and some of our equipment that we use to milk. And keeping a clean parlor and keeping a clean uh, hygiene myself. Thirdly is the consumer, and so the consumer, it's important that they uh, know that they need to keep their milk cold, they need to keep a lid on it, and they need to consume it quickly. Um, unfortunately, we as a society have been accustomed to like milk with a really long shelf life, milk that you can kind of be frivolous with, you know, the advent of, well, what do they call it, ultra temp, ultra high, Ultra pasteurized, basically what it is. Coffee mate, you know, it can just sit on your table. And, I mean, that that like has unfortunately conditioned our behavior towards towards dairy products. Even though like I don't consume coffee mate, and a lot of people don't, that that type of behavior has definitely trickled into our consumer behavior. And so I always remind people like. You know, keep your milk cold, keep a lid on it. Don't go from the farmer's market to the dentist. You know, go from the farmer's market and go home. Or bring a cooler to the farmer's market. You know, there's lots of important steps that the consumer has to take to take responsibility of reducing that risk as well. All right, what are we doing here, Wilder? We're feeding them a mix of cracked organic corn that my father grew. And then they also have a mixed and barley feed with some grit and some omegas. <laughs> oh, man. So what are you doing with these chickens, Wilder? Yeah, so we're doing a pasture egg operation, new to us, new this year. Um, I sell these eggs at the farmer's market and from the farm and there's a it's kind of a cottage industry exemption so if I have less than 300 birds um, I don't have any regulatory red tape so I don't have to have a facility for egg washing I don't have to wash the eggs I don't have to size the eggs I don't have to grade the eggs so you're kind of allowed which I mean to me this is a lot of birds the industry deals in thousands. This is only about 230 birds. Do some customers prefer their eggs non-washed so they don't have to refrigerate them? 
they there's probably those customers out there for sure i have to wash some of my eggs because they're dirty just for presentation purposes and i refrigerate them um just because i assume my customers are going to behave that way okay. so i'm currently getting anywhere from like 12 to 8 dozen a day which is uh, mm, that might be like 60 to 70 percent lay um, which is pretty good they you know there's something that i'm learning is like these chickens um you know they're they're part of the industry which is as i was saying before off camera that industry replaces its flock every year with chickens that are going to lay the most eggs so as a chicken gets older it lays less eggs and so something that like my business is going to have to grapple with is that these chickens are on the decline um, and so of course I'm not gonna have 80 and 90 percent lay mm. just based on their art they've already been used so to speak so the, the guy that you bought them from he was using the chickens for eggs right yeah he used them for eggs for a whole year before I got them and how much did you buy them for eight bucks a piece okay yeah so do you think you'll sell these chickens after a year I have no idea what I'm going to do. <laughs> We've talked about actually considering raising our own from eggs, um, or rather raising our own chicks. And we could do several varieties so we would know, like if we had one breed one year and another breed the next, and maybe we're on a three breed or four breed rotation, we would know when one breed becomes four years old and we could exit those. And if we were raising them ourselves with that extra level of care, they would definitely probably be uh, have a long, longer, longer life, longer production. But yeah, it's all new to me, but it's all really great because it, it offers me one more product that I can offer my customers at my booth. Very um, cool. And eggs is like just one of the most incredible superfoods around. Are farmers markets your primary place of finding customers and making sales? Yeah, currently I only sell direct to customer through farmers markets. Um, partly because I'm I'm really familiar with it having sold vegetables for my father most of my life at farmers markets but also because I think it's really important we have this educational component to um, to food production to agriculture to food systems so I don't want to sell my raw milk without having a conversation of like hey do you currently consume raw milk you know and, and same with these eggs like I want to have that extra level of uh, intimacy and engagement with my customer that the retail setting won't offer. Also, I can't deny that I'm trying to get my feet under me and I don't want to open myself up to a retail setting and then fall short because of supply or some sort of extraneous condition that I couldn't have anticipated and then leave someone shortchanged, you know. Could you delivered. see yourself going to the retail side sometime in the future? Yeah. Certainly. And in fact, in town here, my this is the debuting day, 4th of July, 2023. My father and his wife just opened a, a mercantile, as it's called. And so you can get espresso and ice cream there, but also bulk goods, my milk, my eggs, my father's meat, my father's produce. So we kind of just opened our, oh, you know, not on farm farm stand, but basically our own retail setting. So I'm there um, and I hope that I can stay there. and and that it does well very cool but i think it's the hardest part with all well created and well grown food is that it's inconsistent but that's mm -hmm. like the magic of incons of life is mm -hmm. the inconsistency yeah and so uh, as much as we try to be uniform and regular and regimented there's hiccups in in production and, and in yield and that should be expected and and not anything to, to be a fault hard to express that to a grocery store that deals with shrink percentages and margins and thresholds and quotas and mm. well, I'm just trying to sell the food I have when I have it. Mm. <laughs> and this is a winter squash and pumpkin patch. Cool. And we typically grow winter squash and pumpkins um, on one of my father's farms somewhere else with overhead mm. sprinklers. And this is furrow flood irrigated and uh, it's new to me. I've furrow irrigated corn and obviously alfalfa and pasture. Uh, this is the, my next crop for flood irrigating. So it's kind of fun. I actually hand planted these just about a week ago. 
and I wanted it to be entirely a pumpkin patch because I want to have you know customers come out here or kids and families from the community be able to interface with my farm and yeah, that learn cool. that they can get eggs and milk here. But, uh, it'll be all right. It's going to be a lot of winter squash, and fortunately, it's it's all organic and and we have a market for it, so we'll be able to sell it. Now, this is all just really important literature. Some of it's inspiring, some of it's uh, informative. One Straw Revolution, Masanobo. This uh, this book really changed my, my ultimately like my perspective on life. A lot of philosophy in here, and a lot of uh, examples of like why the industrial farming method might not meet the demands of nature and the and the parameters uh, and um, restrictions of nature. And so, it is a great job of outlining what is known as or been coined as natural farming. Um, and it's just a really powerful book. It's a Japanese gentleman, Japanese farmer. Uh, the Untold Story of Milk, uh, profound uh, and really thorough. Um, I think there's a lot, of, a lot in this book for everyone, especially they, they highlight the atrocities of homogenized milk, which is not something that I was privy to, but it's like, it's definitely like if you can't drink raw milk and you have to drink pasteurized milk, definitely don't drink homogenized milk. And, um, there's everything about the story, the history of why raw milk became uh, taboo, why pasteurization became relevant or prevalent. And uh, it's, a, it's just a really thorough, all the cliff notes, um, references to peer-reviewed articles, so just really thorough. Can you explain the process of pasteurization and uh, homogenization? Yeah, pasteurization is at its minimum uh, milk heated to, well, it doesn't have to be milk, any, any substance, any biological food, liquid. It could be, gra it could be grape juice or apple cider or milk. Um, heated to 162 degrees Fahrenheit for a minimum of 15 seconds. That's the minimum, and that is uh, what is known as vat pasteurization. And certainly if I, if the political landscape ever changed here and I had to pasteurize, I would, I would be pursuing the most minimal form of pasteurization. Um, at 118 degrees though, you know, that's a lot of the raw milk people stand by this. At 118 degrees Fahrenheit, the enzyme lactase breaks down. And there's a lot of people that consume raw milk that have trouble consuming um, pasteurized normal milk and they're kind of self-diagnosed lactose intolerance and it's uh, they find that they can easily digest raw milk because of that lactase enzyme is available and not been degraded by heat so just an interesting little little note to be made about like when is too cooked uh, to drink, so to speak. Um, so yeah, we have like a bunch of different steps above 162 degrees Fahrenheit. At some point before boiling, you get to ultra high. It starts with a U. I used to know what it, what it was. It's like UHTP, I think maybe that's what it is. Ultra high temperature pasteurization. That's how you get that shelf stable coffee mate or like when I was traveling around Mexico, uh, there's like the milk in the store is just on the shelf in an aisle. And then finally, homogenization is ultimately milk's been pushed through a sieve and it breaks down the fat molecules structure and forces it into a smaller, mm, yeah, I don't know, I'm, I'm probably trying to sound too heady and not knowing what I'm talking about, but <laughs> ultimately the fat's been pushed through a screen and the fat no longer is in its original form and so it, it homogenizes with the rest of the milk um, and becomes, uh, yeah, a homogenous mixture of milk protein and milk fat. Basically, it's the milk's pushed through really tiny holes at very high pressure, right? Exactly, yeah, and it breaks down the structure, and there's a lot of people, especially in this untold story of milk, like, referencing, like, the heart damage that homogenization causes to your, to your heart, and that's mm. from those fat molecules getting in your bloodstream and being, like, you know, almost free radicals, like, just 
tearing shit up. It's just uh, it's really, uh, really profound, and I don't even understand it thoroughly, but I do know that I've had people come to me that are like, they'll drink whatever milk as long as it's not homogenized. Mm. They're like, they'll drink it if it's pasteurized, but they're just definitely making sure that their milk's not homogenized. And I thought that was interesting. Um, there's people in lots of different camps, you know, and there's mm. definitely people in that anti-homogenization camp. And it makes sense, you know, we got we got uh, scared and confused by the, the weirdness of food. You know, we always try to only sell the pretty peaches. And so at some point, people probably became disillusioned about the origins of milk and thought it was odd that all that cream was floating on top, you know, and that um, it didn't integrate back into the milk as well, you know. And so definitely the industry and food scientists sought the a product that you wouldn't be afraid of, you know. Um, another book that's really interesting is Milk, A 10,000 Year Food Fracas. And uh, I think it's really powerful because uh, it, it points out a really, like, I think we, we can take a step back from the raw. And there's certainly people that are going to, you know, hang themselves on food safety. And that's fine. But I think a more interesting conversation about milk is whether or not we should be consuming other animals' milk. That conversation is far deeper, in my opinion, and this book touches on it. Some, it has some old references to some Sumerian texts about, like, you know, they used to, like, you know, breastfeeding was unattractive if you were, like, an elite or part of nobility. And so then you would, like, give your kid to some other woman who would be breastfeeding you, and then, like, Maybe you were a little even more poor or not as great if you had to like be raised on like goat milk. You know, like there, there's kind of this like there's a hierarchy. There was a hierarchy about like what milk to drink, and oh, if you drank goat milk, then you'd be more sure-footed. Um, cow's milk, you'd be strong. Like there was just kind of there's a lot of different perspectives through different cultures over time about their relationship with milk. Um, some people, you know preferred butter some people some cultures didn't need butter because they had olives for olive oil so just kind of all these little interesting dynamics over time of like why milk has been such a contentious issue i mean even you can drop the pasteurization raw milk debate and you might have someone telling you you'll you'll clear your eczema up by avoiding dairy and you'll have other people saying if you consume raw dairy you'll have a histamine response that'll actually make you more robust for the allergies in your environment so it's like you know, there is so many interesting discussions to be had around this wonderfully precious product known as, as raw milk. <laughs> and I don't know who gave me this, so we'll skip that. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Raw Milk Revolution, which is a really fascinating book that took place between like 06 and 09. And it's a lot of references to this kind of weird, concerted government action to kind of thwart the United States of raw milk production. So it highlights a farm in California, New York, and Pennsylvania. The federal government had aided all of these states separately to pursue the raw milk producers um, that they wanted to shut down. And so that, this, this one like thoroughly scared the shit out of me. Made me second guess what I was doing. Just, it's a really good look at like, you know, these are the powers that be um, regarding raw milk regulation and then this is my manual for sure the uh dairy farming the beautiful way adam klaus this gentleman's in colorado and this is just everything from like utter prep through a look through the season from calving to weaning and what it takes to make butter and yogurt and how we want to select the genetics for our herd and this book like is I think anybody that wanted to come work for me I'd, I'd just tell them to read this first like this is our operating manual because this gentleman has done exactly what what we have done and then finally you know you can't go wrong with Ferdinand which is just a great kids book that I had read to me over and over again <laughs> so yeah that's the literature that I that I think has helped inform and inspire me and this is a magazine that Wilder was featured in. 
and feel free to pause the screen and read up on it if you'd like. Uh, what magazine is this from, Wilder? Hmm, Taste of Sun Valley, I believe. Yep. Very cool. Okay, that concludes this video. I want to give a huge shout out to Wilder for letting me shoot this with him. It was a ton of fun. Uh, you can check out his social media here. And if you're in the area, Glens Ferry, Idaho, go check out the farm. As always, peace and love. Like and subscribe. See ya.